Hi everyone, in the previous video we talked about how um, the intermolecular forces in liquids uh, give rise to specific properties of liquids like capillary reaction, um, the uh, surface tension of a liquid, and uh, a, a lot of it results from the um, tug of war between the two forces that exist in a liquid, which is the adhesive forces uh, and the cohesive forces. Now, uh, as far as solids are concerned, we're going to mostly talk about what it is, you know, the, the different types of solids, and primarily we're going to focus on crystalline solids, where um, the, we can use the crystals to learn about the structures of the molecules that make up the crystals. So, as you uh, have heard before in this class, I mentioned this before, um, there's you know, a couple different two types of solids that we're, you're going to encounter. The one that you most often see in your test tube when you have a precipitate, for example, and I'm going to show you now a video of, of what these things look like, which is, you know, again, not something new. You've seen this before. So here you can see that as soon as that drop of um, reagent uh, hit the other reagent, right, you form this lead iodide uh, uh, precipitate, uh, and you can see that it's a precipitate because you notice the difference between this side of the uh, of this uh, container, this grad cylinder, versus this side of the container. Over here, you can see through this this uh, container to the object behind it, but over here, your vision is blocked. And whenever you have that, that's always a sign that you have a precipitate. You have some solid particles that are uh, preventing you from seeing through because the solid, of course, is a lot more a lot more dense and you can't really see through that because there's a lot more particles per unit volume. Now if we now go back to this description of uh, precipitate or what you know you can also call an uh, amorphous solid which is basically a solid that doesn't have a regular shape or a regular repeating pattern as we'll talk about the crystalline in a second but the amorphous solid is basically the molecules are just kind of tumbled up together. They they have very strong intermolecular attraction to each other. That's why they're forming the solid, even though water is present. In other words, the interaction between, let's say, the cations and anions are stronger than even water can break. So the water that's present cannot break that interaction. So as a result, the molecules or the ions in this case prefer to precipitate to uh, make a solid as opposed to be dissolved in water in solution. So these uh, solids don't really have characteristic shape. They're sort of just a, gl a glob of molecules or ions combining together. They don't form repeating patterns. And as a result, when you look at them, as you saw in that demonstration earlier, um, it looks more like a powder. Okay, And that's what you always see, of course, all the time in your uh, in, in lab, you see that those uh, powdery substance after you leave it, you know, you let it settle to the bottom of the test tube, you notice that they look like powders, right? And you can stir them and then they sort of cloud up the, uh, the test tubes again. Now, uh, an example of a amorphous solid that you might uh, not know of is common glass. So if you have glass uh, and you look at it, it's actually a solid, but it's sort of a solid that's cooled down uh, very quickly so then it hasn't yet had time to rearrange themselves to a regular pattern and so that's what a uh, that's what glass is so it's not crystalline it's actually um, amorphous it doesn't have a particular shape to it however we distinguish this type of solids uh, with the other type of solid which is what we call crystalline solids now you've heard me use the word crystals before a few times and really what I mean by that is again it's a it's a type of um, solid where the molecules inside the solids make regular repeats like uh, those you see in, a, in a, a wallpaper for example in some kind of a pattern okay so the pattern of that solid is that it repeats themselves again and again you know in one direction in the other direction and also front and back in this in this uh, paper for example so as a result of those regular repeating pattern of the molecules you get specific shapes uh, which of course is what we see as the crystal. So for example, here's just some of the uh, examples of various crystals. This is crystals of ice, uh, crystals of uh, sodium chloride, and crystals of diamond. And if we look at the microscopic uh, arrangement of, in this case, water molecule in ice, 
you notice that it's always arranged this way okay so it's a very regular pattern and in fact you can kind of uh, highlight a certain part of this and just repeat that same pattern that way this way and up and down and you're gonna get the whole pattern repeated so it's sort of like what you do is you find a, a, a you know a, a, a motif okay or a pattern and then you just repeat it a bunch of times up and you know along the three-dimensional axis and you get that crystal as a result of it and that the feature of this crystals would have features of the actual molecules themselves so uh, in other words if we have something and of course I'll talk about this in a second if we have something that's powerful enough we'll be able to look at this crystal and realize that this tells us something about how ice uh, molecules are packed together in the in the structure of ice now sodium chloride Here's another example. Sodium chloride forms very nice crystals. You can see it here. The sodium chloride crystal itself, if you look, you know, in microscopic terms, you find that it's formed out of chloride ions and sodium ions packed together like this in three dimension, as you can see here. It's just a repeating pattern of the sodium and chloride ions together. Uh, diamond, of course, is just carbon atoms. It's actually an atomic crystal. Only has uh, uh, you know the same atom being repeated again and again but in specific arrangement the arrangement looks something like this this is sort of the, the motif that's being repeated again and again in three dimension and as a result we get this you know very nice looking crystals which actually has very um, specific properties you know diamonds have have a lot of properties that uh, you know other uh, types of carbon solid which is graphite doesn't have now the interesting thing about the crystalline solids, of course, is that microscopically they form this repeating pattern. As you remember, hopefully from one of our discussion in a previous, uh, in, in a prior chapter, we talked about this interaction, particularly for an ionic solid like this, for an ionic compound. Um, we call it a lattice. Remember, because that the word lattice is used because lattice refers to this pattern that we see in uh, woodworking, and when you see this same object being repeated again and again and again then we call it a lattice so then the interaction here between the two ions are referred to uh, remember as lattice interactions lattice energy and then we can measure those values to determine the strength of an ionic bond but the idea is your molecules or your atoms or your ions in this case will form this lattice and you can look at the lattice and find the smallest repeating unit okay in other words you try to find your pattern your basic pattern your motif that is being repeated again and again and again to generate the whole uh, crystal. That smallest motif is what's referred to as the unit cell of the um, of the crystal. So in other words, if you take the unit cell and you just extend it, you know, in the x-axis, y-axis, and z-axis, you'd get your all, entire crystal again. Now, the usefulness of a crystalline solid. Uh, or a crystal, another way of saying it is just saying it as a crystal. Uh, the huge importance of this is that you can use crystals to uh, look at basically the structure of the molecules that form the crystal and this is done using something called X-ray crystallography. Now I've mentioned this technique before when I talk about quantum mechanics, uh, when I um, mention about diffraction of waves. The idea here is that you can take a crystal and you can shoot x-rays on it and the, diffract, the diffracted x-ray can then be used to determine what the structure of the molecule is. Uh, you know, uh, you have to build model that would basically uh, represent the, the diffraction pattern that you see experimentally. And I'll explain this in a second in a series of slides. Um, but another... Um, any kind of uh, species actually can form crystals. You can have ions, which are fairly small. Atoms, like carbon, can form crystals. Molecules, even things like sugar, uh, can form crystals. Molecules that are bigger than you know these ions and atoms. But even very large structures, like cell organelles, for example, people have been able to crystallize the ribosome, which can consist of millions of uh, uh, atoms, uh, even billions of atoms uh, combined together and they're still able to obtain crystals of those. As long as you can uh, obtain crystals you can then uh, look at what these atoms look like using x-ray crystallography. The 
uh, context in the crystal, the the context that sustain the crystal that make the crystal look the way it it it, is, it does is of course the IMF that we discussed in the prior section. Okay, so now let's talk just you know briefly about um, a, you know a really important technique here, which is X-ray crystallography. So as I mentioned earlier, you can get crystals from you know just an atom or ions, or you can also get crystals of molecules like water in this case. But as I said just now, you can also get crystals from very large particles. For example, in this case, I'm showing you crystals of different types of proteins. So protein crystals are, you know, in, in your cell, you have many, many different types of proteins. And of course, they all look very different from each other. Uh, and it turns out that you can make them uh, form crystals. And as a result, you can then use the crystals to look at what the protein actually looks like in three dimension and these are just some examples of really beautiful uh, protein crystals that you can uh, then again shoot with x-ray and then obtain the information about the structure of the proteins. Um, proteins by the way is at least a minimum of 10,000 or more atoms. It's a very large molecule. Uh, it's much larger than what we talked about uh, so far, but of course, I, I said earlier, you can even get crystals of things like the ribosome, which is millions or billions of atoms, so it's a lot more than that. Um, but here's how, uh, kind of step by step, how this works. Uh, once you obtain these crystals of proteins, the way X-ray crystallography works is you're going to take that and you're going to uh, do an experiment in something called the diffractometer or uh, an X-ray source. And basically what that is is shown right here size of a person is probably about this high right here, about half the height of this, just to give you a little um, a little feel about the size of this. These nitrogen tanks are usually about the, the height of a, a person. Um, now, you uh, what you do is you're going to put the crystal in here, but this is your x-ray source, so it's going to shoot x-ray from one side. There's going to be a camera, uh, which at this point is usually connected to a computer, so then the image that's taken by that camera, uh, which is the diffraction pattern, will immediately be fed into your computer screen so you can then take a look at what the uh, diffraction pattern looks like. So here's a little uh, zoom in on where the crystal is actually placed. So the crystal is actually going to be placed right here in this little pin. It's very small as you can see. All of these things are very small. Uh, on one side there's going to be a, a stream of liquid nitrogen. Uh, that's blown on the crystal to make sure that it's done at low temperature so that the crystal doesn't degrade um, over time. Here's just another blow up of even closer of what that, uh, you know, place where you put the crystal on. It's actually, it's a little loop. Here's a blow up of that loop itself. So inside this crystal is, I mean, inside this loop is where this crystal is. The loop actually you can't really see most some of them you can but most of them are very very small so you can't really see them with your uh, just own eyes you usually have to look on, uh, uh, under a microscope to see the loop and the crystal has to be fished out under a microscope to be placed inside the loop in a specific solution and then that loop is then placed into this um, something called a goniometer and then what then allows you to do is then there will be an x-ray that comes out from one of these sources here and that's going to shoot and then the camera is right here, we'll take a picture of that and at the end what you're going to see is a picture that looks like this. This is just one of the images that you're going to collect. This is a diffraction pattern. If you remember, diffraction pattern is something where there's a dark, intense and then light pattern uh, because of the constructive and destructive interference pattern coming together. And from this pattern and many, many others like it, you can then combine them to make build a model of what the molecules look like. This is just one such model of a smaller, of a small part of the protein that, um, where this uh, diffraction pattern generates, okay? And over time, if you build the entire model, you can then get a model of the entire molecule, which looks something like this. This would be with the entire 10,000 or 20,000 atoms that you have in that protein. This molecule itself is called alcohol dehydrogenase. It's a protein that helps you metabolize alcohol when you drink them. And this is shown with the substrate. The substrate is the molecule that it works with. In this particular case, it's one of the metabolic molecules. And it's very small, as you can see, compared to the enzyme itself, the protein itself.